Mr. Aaron Roth. Thank you. Woo! There wasn't one. <laughs> we needed one. Uh, but anyway, the, uh, the faithful see my perspective as though it were just another religion. And uh, some of them, some of these other religions, like to misrepresent and ridicule all other people's beliefs equally. And that you see here. Uh, these are religious tracts. Hopefully, you are not familiar with these. <laughs> I'm sorry to say that I grew up with these. The first one of these that I encountered was when I was eight years old. It was left on the couch when my mother hired a babysitter for me. Put the light on, we'll see. Can you put the light on? Lights. You can't hear me. Okay. All right. These, these religious tracts are designed to be left on vacant seats, public tables. Uh, and any avenue, under your, your windshield wiper on your car, anywhere where they might convert some susceptible students, foolish enough, or to, to accidentally discover one. Um, and just a second, put some stuff together on these. As I said, when I found the first one, I was eight years old. These are generally intended for adults. But I was eight the first time I, I found one. And I found it very disturbing when I read it. Because one, it was beneath my intellect as an eight-year-old. <laughs> but worse than that, it was like having the symptoms of psychosis in printed format. I found this in my mother's house and I was disturbed that someone she knew would be presenting something like this because whoever wrote this, as you can, as you can see, I mean, I'll have one hand for each of these to give you some idea of the content in each one. And also to show you that the effect that they have on normal, rational people is quite the opposite of that which is intended. They're usually quite repugnant. And as I said, I've seen many of these growing up. Uh, my babysitters, several of them, were of this sort, I'm sorry to say. Unbeknownst, it seems, to my family. Now, my family had a tradition wherein children were not indoctrinated until they were eight years old. This was considered the age of reason. And by then, I had been through second grade. I had read dinosaur books. I had understood cladograms. I understood taxonomy, the basic tenets of it. I understood evolution. So imagine what, but I didn't meet another evolutionist at all until I was 14. I was the only one I knew. <coughs> my own family. There was no one in my family who shared this perspective. I was the only one. Imagine what it was like being raised by people of this sort. Because they had no qualms against pushing their religious beliefs onto other people's kids. 
They told me sexist things. Uh, why women could not be fighter pilots, because something having to do with their depth perception, all kinds of made up stuff like that. Why, why various races couldn't do as well as other races, because of their natural tendencies, with all kinds of made up crap. I was also fed the typical partisan propaganda that you would expect of someone from this mindset. And they didn't teach me Bible stories or anything like that. They didn't try to make me believe the things that they did. Instead, they wanted me to think the way that they did. And they used um, colorful phrases that were as counterintuitive as they come. One of them being, might makes right. And they actually expected me to believe this. This is a, a doctrine of authoritarianism. And another one was, uh, ignorance is bliss. That one stunned me that the people actually meant that. I caused such an argument at my babysitter's house when I said, but knowledge is power. <laughs> and she responded, you know, ours is not the reason why. Ours is but to do or die, which is more authoritarianism. I didn't realize then that I was already immersed in a creation versus evolution debate. Though, I do remember them telling me about polystrate trees, and uh, flash frozen mammoths, and all the same arguments that I've since refuted in my adult life again and again and again, and they just keep coming up because they never admit to me. And as you can see, um, they were very good at ridiculing other people's religions. For example, this one here says that Catholics are very worshiping pagans. Uh, let's see, this one here says, it's a Mormon one, there we go. The Mormons are pagans too. This one says the Masons are pagans and that all pagans are devil worshippers. Uh, the anti-pagan one is actually not pagan. It says that they're Satanists and that a TV sitcom was created for the purpose of spreading Satanism. You can guess which one. <laughs> this one was the most offensive I think I've ever seen because this one said that all the gods of India were created by Satan. Which is a bit of a trick, because this is the oldest religion in the world. It predates Satan and the religion he comes from, so that was quite a <laughs> uh, Most amusingly for me was that the anti-Jewish, the anti-Semitic crack here, says that Jews are damned to hell for obeying the very first commandment. But look at this one. Here we have, not just, this is not just any Muslim, this is Muhammad. And he is in a compromised position. It is a drawing of Muhammad in a humiliating position. Why didn't this cartoonist get any death threats? I think, maybe. It's because religious extremists must consider Jack Chick to be one of their own. Jack Chick is the one who created these. He's been running them for decades. He runs Chick Publications. And I had the misfortune of being handed comic books of this sort ever since I was a child. Now, the one we're going to concentrate on today, of course, this one. According to this tract, our religion is called evolution. Now, whether you believe in a god or not, whether you have a religion or not, if you accept evolution, then you know that that tract is lying. No one declares evolution as their religion. <laughs> Fundamentalists know that, but they don't care about factual accuracy. This is an emotional appeal, wherein the, uh, the illusion of certainty is critical, and truth is rendered irrelevant. Let's open this one up. <clears throat> what you see here is only half the comic. If you want, you can go to chick.com. You can read the entirety of this chip this kind or any of their other tracks are available for free online chick.com you will not enjoy the experience <laughs> but uh, and i'm not going to read this to you but we will run through a quick uh, summary now in the first row up here we have a just so story wherein uh, she's describing the evolutionary scenario and she uses the word science whenever a believer would have said god then we have the second row, which gives us wonderfully accurate depiction of evolution. I mean, this is exactly what the fossil record shows. <laughs> okay. And so on, until you get to the end of the third row, it's survival of the fittest. 
Only the strong survive. And we know that Charles Darwin never actually uttered those words, or he never used them in writing anyway. That citation comes from an economist named Herbert Spencer, and it was his misinterpretation of natural selection which led to social Darwinism. I'm sure most of you already know that, and any of you like that could probably find something glaringly wrong in probably every or any pain of this track thus far. I can't help but comment on this one. Evolution does away with morals. <laughs> Y'all remember the speech I gave when I was here last night? <laughs> so this kid says, wow, anything goes. I can lie. I can cheat. I can write religious tracts for chick.com. <laughs> What's to keep me from becoming a god? How about the fact that you're not immortal and you don't have any magic powers? That is the definition of a god. But this is the focus of today's talk. Mind you, this is what I was raised with. Hopefully none of you were. My hair is blonde and I have blue eyes, so I am above all others. I am part of the master race. I've taken evolution in college. I don't remember. <laughs> but it's worse in the next panel when the subtitle says, evolution's final solution is the elimination of the weaker? Can anyone cite for me, in any, any of Darwin's books, um, or any evolutionary scientist thereafter, where we will find anything like that. Now, um, ironically, we find it in our holy books often enough. Uh, when, for example, we have to dispatch the Canaanites in order to make room for the chosen. This is where we get into eugenics, because of the, we're running short on time, I'm going to uh, stick to the script here pretty closely. Uh, eugenics is also known as social Darwinism, it was promoted in Asia, Europe, and for a brief time in the U.S. It was presented, as you can see, as an aspect of evolution, even though it was never espoused by Darwin himself, and in fact it predates Darwin by a few millennia. Eugenics is when humans use artificial selection and differential, uh, differential breeding, or let me see, that uh, was an appropriate way to put that, differential birth rates, uh, with the specific intent of promoting or eliminating particular traits in future generations. There are two applications of it defined as positive or negative, and the dominant religions in the world have apparently used both throughout their history. For example, if an imam uh, decrees that Muslim emigrants should breed more prolifically than native Europeans with the specific goal of eventually achieving the dominant demographic. That is an example of positive eugenics. Likewise, birth control, castration, <coughs> isolation, and genocide are examples of negative uh, eugenics, and all of these examples are bountiful throughout scripture. Um, if you have a particular group that follows the combined mandate of being fruitful and multiplying while killing the infidels, you will very soon have a population of obedient believers. And if there are any aberrant atavisms or skeptical thought, they will usually be quiet about it. However, from an actual Darwinian and a humanist perspective, evolution is a harsh reality because as civilization provides and protects the rights of people to live and love despite their various weaknesses, those frailties will no longer inhibit uh, reproduction and uh, existence and may eventually incorporate into the dominant gene. While these will never be preferential, some degree of those, uh, these influences will be inevitable. However, there is no humane or ethical way to incorporate selective breeding as a means of improving our species. An appropriate answer to that question must be found somewhere else.